to my computer and hopefully it will be able to be um, uh, uploaded at some point to Jared's website. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start by welcoming everybody who's here and saying thank you for our, uh, this is a foray uh, for the two of us. Um, my name is Deanna McDonald. I am uh, an instructor in the mathematics department at the University of Arizona and my wheelhouse is statistics because I previously was a high school teacher for several decades where I taught AP stats almost from the beginning of its inception. And then I became an AP reader and I am a rubric team member where I help develop the, the, the directions for or the instructions for other readers to assess papers for AP stat students. And, and I'm going to be doing that again this summer. So I've been doing that since 2006. And then Jared. Hi, my name is Jared Dirksen. Um, gosh, I teach at a suburban Southern California high school. I've taught AP stats for this is year. I started in fall of 98. So um, yeah, been doing it for a long time. My students took the 99 test. Um, I teach with one of the students who took the 99 test with me and her son is in my math club. Um, so yeah, and um, uh, Deanna and I co-write Five Steps to a Five, um, but we're really just here to help you guys with the AP exam and to give you guys some good pointers. Um, and so Deanna's gonna do um, the vast majority of the talking and explaining tonight. So Deanna, take it away. Okay, and Jared's going to be answering questions in the Q&A, so if you have any, put them there, and he will interrupt me because we're friends and it doesn't bother me. Anytime I need to be interrupted, either to adjust what I say or to address a question that's in the Q&A. All right, so we've got someone who raised their hand, so my assumption is, is that, um, uh, Jared, you'll take care of that through the chat? Will do. Okay. All right, so we Jared calls this a super six. So this is completely and totally um, his baby. So he created this from uh, previous uh, AP stat exam questions and made it so that it was a little bit more uh, substantive. And so that's where this comes from. So this is the first question. Um, we're comparing success rates for treating allergies at two clinics. Uh, th these allergy, they, they specialize in treating allergy sufferers and researchers selected important random samples of patient records from these two clinics. And then the table summarizes the data. And we're being asked, and this was asked on an AP exam, to complete the following table and record the relative frequency. So one of my first tips to students is to have a pen and a pencil and to underline phrases like relative frequency so that you recognize what it is that you're supposed to do. The next piece of it is the relative frequencies are at each clinic. So what does that mean? It means that we're looking at only clinic A and clinic B and calculating percentages because that's what relative frequencies are. So we take 51 divided by 139 to get this value. And then we go and take 88 divided by 139 to get this value. And we do exactly the same thing for clinic B. So there are our relative frequencies. And if this were an AP exam, we would have appropriately filled in at least that component of the, of the response. So the next piece of it asks, it says, based on the relative frequency, which clean clinic is more successful in treating allergy sufferers? Important part of the question, justify your answer. So you can't just pick one, you have to tell why. So it says, we're saying here that clinic A is more successful in treating allergy sufferers than clinic B because the greater percentage of, they have a greater percentage of allergy sufferers treated uh, successfully than clinic B has. And we're citing the values in our solution. Notice that what I did was I made a conclusion and I linked it to the calculations that are part of the problem. And that's an important piece to keep in mind is that when you have values, you wanna link them to those values in the context of the problem. Okay, so the next part of the question 
asks, based on the design of the study, would a statistically significant result allow the researchers to conclude that receiving treatments at the clinic that you selected in part A, notice that they don't assume the correct answer here. They let you go back to the previous answer, um, caused a higher percentage of successful treatments than at the other clinic. And again, explain your answer. So this, the solution here is no. So there's the answer to the question. No, this is an observational study. It's not a randomized experiment. And so I'm going to I'm going to fill that in and say cause and effect can only be established with a well-designed randomized experiment. There might be other variables besides where the patient was treated that affects the success rates for treating allergies. And then we go on to give an example. For example, clinic A may treat mostly mild allergy cases that are easy to treat successfully while clinic B may mostly treat severe allergy cases that are more difficult to successfully treat. All right, so we have this physician and this physician works at both clinics. Um, and this physician constructed the following mosaic plot. So here's the mosaic plot. The values in the mosaic plot represent the number of patients who were either successfully treated or unsuccessfully treated in each severity group. And so, for example, the number 78 represents the number of patients that were successfully treated in the mild group at clinic A. And so you can see the rest of the mosaic plot is set up in that same way. Based on the mosaic plot, the physician decided the following. For mild allergy sufferers, Clinic B was more successful in treating allergies. How did he decide that? Well, he looked at the height or the percentage in that uh, category and said, oh, look, it's higher. And then for severe allergy sufferers, Clinic B was more successful in treating allergies and did the same exact thing. Said, so look at the percentage here in the mosaic plot. It's at a higher level than Clinic A. So for each clinic, which al allergy severity was treated more successfully? Justify your answer. All right, so let's look at this, justify my answer. I'm going to pick clinic A and I'm gonna say for clinic A, we got mild treated more successfully. How do I know that? Because I can see the bar is higher than it is for severity or for, for severe allergies. And so I'm going to give it a number, 75%. You can get that number uh, by calculating the proportion, 78 out of the total. But I'm not going to do it that way. I'm just going to look at the, the level and say um, it's higher because you can see it in the picture. In the answer, I still give the, the numbers. And so for clinic B, also mild allergies have a higher percentage rate for clinic B. And so clinic B is more successful in treating mild allergies. And then give the X the number 11 out of uh, uh, 12, 91.7%, but only 42% of the severe allergy sufferers. So you'll notice that the answers are in the context of the problem. And that's one of the suggestions that we all teachers across the country, uh, everywhere who's teaching AP stats will say, Context matters, so make sure you answer the question in the context of the problem. And then for each clinic, which allergy severity is most likely to be, more likely to be treated? And again, justify your answer. So for clinic A, I'm gonna look at the width of the mosaic plot section and use that to help me to answer this question. And since mild has a wider width, I'm more likely to treat mild allergy sufferers than severe allergy sufferers. And then I'm gonna back it up with some numbers. And then for clinic B, I look at the width for the mild, or sorry, for the severe, that one's wider. And so we're gonna be more likely to treat severe allergy sufferers than mild allergy sufferers at clinic B. And so again, I'm gonna back it up with some numbers. So the mosaic plot gives us a physical representation of the different sample sizes, and then I can convert those into relative frequencies. Okay, I'm gonna take a moment and make sure, Jared, are we all caught up on any questions people have? Uh, mostly, we have a question in the chat about reading mosaic plots, and that question kind of came up when you were right in the middle of explaining them. Um, 
And so I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more about how they work in terms of area or that the X and Y axes both have a scale or. Um... So if you haven't, if you haven't been exposed to mosaic plots, the, the benefit of a mosaic plot is it gives us a, a, a relative idea about the differences in the sample sizes for the different categories within, for example, clinic A. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into how you physically make them because that's a more complex conversation. But the, the width of the mild compared to the width of the severe is proportional to the size of the samples overall. So the, the entire horizontal axis represents a length of one. And so the mild's length is the proportion out of the total number of people who are treated at clinic A. And then the height of it represents 100%. So 100% meaning for that category, what percentage are treated successfully for mild versus for severe? And I'm hoping that that is, is helpful. Okay. So I'll just add that that in a bar chart, usually the um, x-axis is not an axis at all. It's just a table that the bars are sitting on, and only the vertical axis gives us any information. So the big change with the mosaic plot is now that the x-axis, instead of being just a, a landing spot for my bars, is now actually has a scale to it. Um, so you can read one variable on the x-axis and you can read other information on the y-axis. And I think that's maybe a helpful distinction. Okay, agreed. I take your point and I keep it. So we're gonna use our answers from part C and we're gonna give a reasonable explanation of why the more successful clinic identified in part A, part two, is the same as or different from the physician's conclusion that part B is more successful in treating both severe and mild allergies. So here's the two bits of information that we would be able to look back at when we took an AP exam. The more successful clinic identified in part A, number two, is clinic A, which is different from the physician's clinic that clinic B is better when taking allergy severity into account. Now, why might that be? Well, this happens because for both clinics, the success rate is much higher for milder, mild allergy sufferers. So 75% versus 28% and 91 versus 42-ish percent for clinic B. But clinic A treats mostly mild allergy sufferers, a significant increase over the percentage in clinic B so again, there's that width that's sort of giving me that help, helpful hint there. Therefore, combining results across the, let me move myself out of the way here, across allergy severity categories, the facts that clinic, clinic A treats a larger proportion of mild allergy sufferers and mild allergy sufferers have the higher success rate make it appear as if cl clinic A is better overall. Okay, in further study, a researcher decides to take a simple random sample of the patient seen by clinic A and using a list of all the patients, describe a method for selecting a sample of size 20. So this comes up on the AP exam frequently. How do you do something? You need to be very careful to describe precisely what it is that you want to do. So first thing you wanna do is you wanna number your patients from one to however many there are. We don't know because it didn't tell us, so we're gonna say N. And then we use a random number generator to select 200, and this is the important word here, unique numbers from one to N. You don't want any repeats. So if you don't say unique, you have a partially correct solution already. And then this is sort of a, 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 an icing on the cake thing. Make sure you contact the patients with those numbers for your sample, because it's not the numbers that are in the sample, it's the people. 
All right, let's take a sample a different way. Let's conduct a systematic random sample. So again, using a random number generator, we're going to select a random number between 1 and 10. And then we're going to start the list with that patient. So for example, I might have randomly generated 7. So I'm going to start with patient number 7. And then I'm going to select every 20th patient after that for my sample. Now, Jared and I discussed this. And we have not seen where you have to, in a free response, Describe how to take a systematic sample. Instead, it's more likely that you're going to see a description and have to recognize that what you see described is a systematic random sample. All right. A researcher notes that the patients at Clinic B come from two very different neighborhoods, one that has a higher socioeconomic level and one that is lower. Describe and name the sampling method that the researchers would use to take the source of variation into account. So to account for the variation created by these differences, a stratified random sample should be selected. So I've just named the sampling technique. And now I need to describe it. The researcher should randomly select some patients from both levels to comprise that sample. And I don't need to just, I'm not going to describe anything else, but basically what it would be is if you were to take the group, whenever we number from one to N and do the same kind of random sampling from group that's lower SES and then number from one to other N and um, take a random sample of the other group. So this is the description of how it happens. All right. Researcher received a grant to study the health insurance status for potential patients in the city. They draw a grid on the map of the city, and, they, and each square has 50 homes in it, roughly. And they randomly select five of the squares and use all of the homes from those five squares to collect their sample. So the question is, what's the name of the sampling method? And describe any advantages or disadvantages to this method. So this is what we call a cluster sample. That's the name of it. And so here's a, an advantage. If the cluster of homes adequately represent the entire city, this method makes it easier to contact people. So if you get into your work life or research life in public health, this is how they sample from their different populations or different neighborhoods. They take an entire cluster of, and sample from that. However, here's a disadvantage. There are probably concerns that the five clusters chosen would leave out certain subgroups of the city and therefore not be representative. So I've done what it asked. I've given an advantage and I've given a disadvantage. You need to make sure that you answer the question completely so that you're on the way to an E for essentially correct. Because if you leave out either one of those parts, an advantage or disadvantage, you're only going to get a partially correct solution at best. I always uh, show my students a silly video where someone is asked to make a write down the instructions for making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And then the, the person making the sandwich follows their direction absolutely literally and then you know ends up smashing the jar of peanut butter on the bread and all sorts of silliness you know or scoops out the jelly with their fingers because it didn't say to use a knife um this is the type of literalness you need to think for like the last i don't know four or five questions you need to describe every step as if the person you are talking to has no common sense <laughs> <laughs> no statistical common sense. Yeah, yep. And so you just need to really lay out every every little step. You know, put put everyone's name on a piece of paper. Put the papers in a hat. Stir the names in the hat. Pull out a name. You know, just every single step. So, yeah. yep. That's that's what you need to do. This will probably be uh number 2 on the AP test in all likelihood where you're talking uh -huh. about a survey or an experiment. Probably. Anyway, go ahead, my friend. So this part, using the original data, we're going to do some probability. What's the probability that a randomly selected patient 
had successful treatment. You just have to read this out of the table. It's 123 people out of a total of 207 and then turn it into either that's a, a relative frequency as a percentage, or you could write it as a proportion and just use a decimal fraction. Um, or had a successful treatment, ooh, important word, given that they were seen at clinic A. I'm not talking about everybody. I'm only talking about the people at clinic A. So my denominator is only 139. So that would be roughly 63.6, uh, 3%. Had successful treatment or were seen at clinic A. So this is where I use, I can use common sense or I can use one of the formulas for probability. I take 123 seen successful treatment, 139 who had, um, were seen at clinic A, but then I have to subtract the overlap and then divide it by 207. What about had successful treatment and were seen at clinic A? So those are the people with both labels on their forehead. And there are 88 of them out of the total of 207. So that's 42.5%. So the next question that goes along with this is, are the events a successful treatment and seen at clinic A independent? So we're going to use the two probabilities from part one that are part I that uh, correctly answer this question. And so these are the two that we need because I want to know what's the probability of successful, 59.4%, and what's the probability of successful given the other event, given that I know they're from clinic A? Well, that's 63.3%. Now, we're going to get uh, values that are not equal to each other. So since these percentages are not equal, we would say that the clinic and success, clinic A and success are not independent. Now you might ask yourself, but they're kind of close, isn't that okay? And that's a question for a different kind of analysis. That would be when you would answer that question using some kind of an inference procedure. Right now, if they're not exactly the same value, we're gonna say that they're not independent. Should we pause right here and ask them what in inference procedure would answer that question? I don't know. I I might I might have one coming up. Oh, you so have that coming I, up. I, right. I I built it in. All okay. right. All right. You're great. Right. So, oh, one more survey. The researcher interviews the first 50 patients in a given day. What is the name of this method and why might it lead to a biased result? Include the concept of undercoverage in your decision. So this is where I insert my own observation that you're all supposed to live in this world and you're supposed to be able to use some common sense about how the world works with respect to allergies. This is a convenient sample. That's the name of it. It will undercover the patients who come later in the day. What does that mean? The people who come later in the day have no chance of being in your sample. So suppose that the people, this is, this is the part where you live in the world, suppose that the people who work all day outdoors must come to the clinic later in the day after work. So it's a convenient sample. They work outdoors. Well, why might that be a problem? Well, those patients might have worse allergies because they work outdoors and be more difficult to treat. And this would lead to an overestimate of the success rate, making it look better than the rate actually is. So I identify the source of the bias as well as the direction in my solution. So there's the source and there's the direction. Okay. Oh, one more survey, but it's the last. The researcher mails a survey to all of the patients in the clinic. Now, when I send a survey out to every single person, I'm thinking that might be a census. I'm gonna ask them to fill out an online form, describe this method and its probable bias. Well, again, you live in the world. What's gonna happen? Well, this is a voluntary response. I'm inviting people to respond to my survey. So only the people with very strong emotions will fill out the survey and probably people with unsuccessful treatments. Again, I'm living in the world and that's my guess. This will lead to probably a very severe underestimate of the success rate of the treatment. So there's my identification and there's my direction. 
Okay. Whew. A physician notes that the patients at Clinic B tend to have a higher socioeconomic status than those at Clinic A. Explain how this might create a confounding variable. So there's a vocabulary word there. Having a higher socioeconomic status might lead to patients having access to other extra treatments beyond those provided by the clinic. So those extra treatments might lead to a higher success rate. In the end, we would be uncertain if the higher success rate was caused by the choice of the clinic or by those extra treatments that some patients could afford. Uh-oh, patients who fail to follow their doctor's instructions, there's a lot of us who do that, uh, may be embarrassed to admit that the treatments were unsuccessful. Describe how this might create both a non-response and a response bias. So I've got two of them. Let's go with the first, non-response. The embarrassment could lead to a disproportionate number of unsuccessful patients declining to answer the survey. That's non-response bias. But what about response bias? Well, it could also lead to patients whose treatment was unsuccessful responding to the survey, but not telling the truth and stated that the treatment was successful, there's your response bias, because they don't want to admit that they didn't follow the instructions. In both cases, the parameter would be underestimated. Oh, shoot. Okay, um, you have to pretend that you didn't see that because I I am so sorry. This is Jared, epic fail. Okay, everyone, pretend you can't see that. Suppose that the overall success rate for all clinics treating allergy sufferers is 60%. What is the name of the procedure that would help answer this question? <laughs> Do these data provide convincing evidence that the overall success rate of clinic A is different than the overall success rate for all clinics? All right, statistics fans, I want you to notice that I, I, I was hoping that you would just think it on your own, but clearly I, I failed to animate this correctly. I want you to notice that my um, convention for telling my students what to write is not dependent on technology. I have my students write out what it is, that they're going to do a Z test for a population proportion. And this is just Deanna McDonald teaching at a university where there are lots of different things that they can do to do calculations. I know that in AP world, you might say something different, but notice how this is now agnostic with respect to the type of technology that you might hold in your hand, basically a Texas Instruments calculator. And yet it tells exactly the same thing. So Jared, do you have any comments about that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the common AP response would be one prop Z test. Um, that would be really common. Um, so um, the more you communicate, the better off you are. Um, but you also have to choose how much to say, given the time parameters, time constraints that you're in on test day. So um, say what you're comfortable with, communicate a lot, and you'll be fine. So. Okay, I'm I'm crossing my fingers that I didn't screw up the animation on this one either. Let's what? see. Okay. Uh, oh, I did. Okay. All right, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everyone. All right. What is the name of the procedure that would help answer this question? Do these data provide convincing evidence that the overall success rate of clinic A is greater than that of clinic B? And I I animated too soon. But if you were to answer this question, you probably phrase it differently than I do. I teach at a university. So again, things are slightly different here. So I would have my students say a Z test for two population proportions. You'd probably say a two prop Z test, right? So I think we should, if you don't mind, and I think we're doing fine time-wise, um, I think we should maybe ask an interesting question. Were you going to talk about what else you could do with this table? I I was going to leave that now. That was going to be just an oral question because I thought, okay. you know. Okay. So, so go ahead, Jared. Ask him. Well, I mean, I think 
for all the students here, you very recently, very, very recently learned how to do a hypothesis test with a two by two table. Um, so a lot of you are probably looking at this problem thinking, couldn't I just run a chi-squared with that table? Um, and that is a really good thought that has a somewhat subtle answer. Um, because you could run a chi-squared test on this table. The only problem is the way my friend Deanna worded the question was she asked if clinic A is greater than clinic B. Um, and chi-squared doesn't have any direction to it. Um, it won't tell you greater or less. It will just tell you if the observed counts are different than the expected counts. So you would probably get some credit if you ran chi-squared on this table because it is categorical and it is looking at the two variables on the table, um, but you couldn't get full credit because the question was one-sided greater than. It wasn't a two-sided question. Yeah, so, and that was purposeful on my part, but then yeah, I screw up yeah. the animations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if we if we want to throw in one more fun fact here, um, this is a fun math fact that, you know, we're not going to take time to prove. But if you do the two prop Z test on this two by two table, um, you get a Z score that if you square it actually comes out to the chi squared test statistic for the chi-squared test for independence. Um, and so, yeah. And if it's a two-sided question, then the p-values are exactly the same. So it doesn't matter which one you do. So anyway, but we should plunge on ahead, so. Okay, so we're gonna go on to the second question of the super six that, that Jared has created for us. And the this question is also from an AP exam. I actually graded this exam. Uh, uh, I think it was last year, the mm -hmm. researchers uh, constructed a histogram shown for the dissolved oxygen concentration in streams from the sample with water temperatures colder than eight degrees uh, Celsius. And so what I want to do is I want you to all right now write down a possible value for the minimum observation in this data set and then write down a possible value for the maximum observation in this data set. I want you to just do that. You, you don't have to share with us what you wrote down because it's only going to be between you and your, you know, you and your pencil. But go ahead and do that real quick. Count down five, four, three, two. Oh, that's terrible. One. Okay. I know that looks funny, but I'm still going to do it that way. All right. So here's here's how I decided to do this. All right, I want to remind you that this is a histogram. And the way that the histograms convention goes is that the right-hand endpoint is a closed endpoint of, e of each bin, and the left-hand endpoint is an open endpoint. So your lowest value should be somewhere between two and three. You can use two, but you can't use three. So a possible value for this minimum is any value that you wrote down starting with two and up to, but not including three. So if you wrote down three, that would be incorrect. And then for the upper value, the same thing for the maximum, you've got the same thing going on. You've got, you've got a closed endpoint at 13 and an open endpoint at 14. So what you wrote down could be, for the maximum, could be any value starting with 13 and up to, but not including 14. Now, I wonder if any of you wrote down 117 because a grip ton of students who took the AP exam for this question used the numbers at the top of those bars as if they were the measurements of dissolved oxygen. They're not. Those are the frequencies of the observations that are in that interval or in that bin. So you're not allowed to consider that there's 46 as an observational measurement. 46 is the frequency of the values between 13 and 14. And so this is where students under stress taking an AP exam tend to fall apart is they don't adequately evaluate what they're seeing and make sure that they understand the graph completely. So take your time, read it carefully. All right, so let's look at the question that goes with this. 
So based on the histogram, we want to describe the distribution of dissolved oxygen concentration in streams with water temperatures that are colder than eight degrees Celsius. So the first thing we're going to do is look at shape, and we're going to say that the histogram of dissolved oxygen in uh, Alaskan streams with water temperature colder than eight degrees is unimodal. That means it only has one uh, peak and skew to the left. So just as a reminder, when you are looking to describe skew, think about holding the tail with one of your hands, and if you grab it with your left hand, that makes it skew to the left and vice versa. The toes on your left foot are skewed left. <laughs> the toes on your left foot. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Fun fact. Just wear your open-toed sandals on the day of the AP exam. All right, so we're going to pop this one in here. Uh, there are 429 observations, and I assume that on the AP exam, they would have told us that. But if they don't, we just have to add up all the frequencies in each of the bars. It comes out to be 429. And the median is then, uh, we're going to divide up the, the list into half of the observations less and half more than the median. So that's the 215th observation would be the median. And then I physically have to count. So if I count the frequencies and I get 177 when I add up from everything up to the 10 to 11 bin, I know that in the next bin, the median has to be located. And so that means that the median is between 11 and 12 milligrams per liter. And then for the first quartile, just because this is kind of fun for me, I find the first quartile, it's again going to be the hundred between the 107th and the 108th observation. And I'm going to count up the frequencies to get to the 9 to 10 bin. And then the next bin over is where the first quartile is located. And then I would work my way backward and count from the, the right to find the third quartile. And that's between the 12 and the 13th, uh, 12 and 13 milligrams per liter. There do not appear to be any outliers, uh, but there are high ones, but there appear to be several potential low ones because the values in the two to three, four to five, and five to six bins are all certainly more than one and a half times the IQR, which we've calculated to be approximately two. Um, so it's more than that below the first quartile. All right, we good, Jared? This is a lot. Notice I have described the shape the center with the median, the variability with the IRQ, uh, sorry, the IQR, and whether or not there are any outliers by using a modified form of the 1.5 times the IQR because I can't precisely find my lower fence. All right, so now I have these summary statistics and I want to construct a box plot, but notice it says do not indi indicate outliers. I cannot tell you how many students ignored that and said, I'm just going to try to put the outliers in there. When you when it says do not indicate outliers, what you want to do is put the five number summaries as dots, draw your box, show your median, and then connect the whiskers from the edges of the box all the way out to the mins and the max. That's what it means when it says do not indicate outliers. So now I want to know, using the characteristics of the distributions of the two different stream sets, which streams generally are healthier? And I want to justify my answer. So again, using the characteristics of the distributions, both distributions. So here's both distributions again. So let me think. It says that generally streams are healthier when they're colder. Okay. Or generally streams with higher dissolved oxygen. Students got confused about this. So back at the very first sentence, it says streams with higher dissolved oxygen concentrates are, are healthier. So I'm going to say this, if the researcher's belief is correct, then the streams with water temperature colder than eight degrees Celsius are healthier for wildlife. So I've picked one. Why is that so? I want to justify my answer. 
the distribution of dissolved oxygen concentration for colder has a higher center because its median is larger than the median for warmer streams. So I'm basing it on the characteristics that I see. The shape of the distribution is different than the shape for, for uh, colder than the shape for warmer. The distribution of values uh, is skewed to the left. That's the description of shape. But the distribution of values for warmer is skewed to the, to the right. Both distributions have a similar spread. I would say in, 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 I would say variability, have a similar variability, because they both have similar IQR values, approximately 2 and approximately 1.7 for the warmer streams. So I've justified my choice using the characteristics as I was uh, required. Okay, so now it says, use the two standard deviation rule, as well as the outlier fences that we found from part B, to check for outliers and then compare these two results and discuss any differences between them. All right, so here's the IQR rule. I'm finding my fences. I'm subtracting, or five, excuse me, I'm finding the IQR, the intercortical range, and then I'm taking 1.5 times that IQR and I'm adding it to the upper quartile, quartile three, and then I'm subtracting it from the lower quartile, quartile one, to get my fences. So these are the fences for outlier land. If you're within the fences, you're not an outlier. If you're outside the fences, you're an outlier according to this rule. So the minimum of 2.1 is above the lower fence. So there are no outliers, no low outliers in this distribution. But the maximum of 13.45 is beyond the upper fence. So there's, and this is important, at least one. I don't know if there's any more, but I know there's at least that one. So now I'm gonna go for the two standard deviation rule. I'm gonna take the mean and I'm gonna add and subtract two standard deviations to get new boundaries. So this, these are my new boundaries, 2.26 and 8.82. So there's my picture just to ping me about what's happening. Because the mean and the standard deviation are not resistant, these data are clearly right skewed. Oh no, and these data are clearly right skewed. And this is not the best way to test for outliers. In fact, in my class, we're not allowed to do that at all. So notice that this rule, this rule, the two standard deviation rule, would tell us that the minimum would be an outlier because the minimum is past two point, it's beyond 2.26. It's 2.10. That doesn't at all seem appropriate when I look at the picture. So because there's this inconsistency and appropriateness, the difference between them is I feel more confident with the IQR rule than I do with the standard deviation rule. Okay, how are we doing, Jared? Doing great. Um, okay. I just will mention that um, the original AP question was parts A, B, and C. And now from part D onward, these are questions that I wrote to, to make um, these questions comprehensive. So, um, you guys, everyone listening has probably done a, a ton of practice FRQs by now, a bunch of frappies. Um, but um, anyway, so yeah. Um, the first question we did was a was an investigative task. So I think the original parts of that, what stopped at, where did it stop? It, it was a longer question since it was an investigative task. I think it went through A through D was the original question. And then parts E and following were questions I wrote. So just for the sake of clarity. Um, yep. So go ahead, my friend. All right. So if the data from part A, the colder than eight degrees Celsius, were made into a stem plot, how would you round the data? I want you to write a key for that stem plot, how the stem plot would use. Um, but here's the thing. I kind of pinged you so that you would get this right, thinking about what's the minimum value and what's the maximum value that's that could be possible. If you think about it, any of those numbers between two and three are legit possible measurements for these dissolved oxygen in these streams. Likewise, anything between 10 and 11, legit possible outlier, uh, possible measurements. So when you think about those values and look at the frequency at the top of the, of the bar, there's 94 measurements between 10 and 11. 
it's highly unlikely that the, the researchers rounded everything to whole numbers. In fact, it's much more likely that they did this, that they rounded to the nearest tenth. And so our key would look like this. Nine slash seven would be representative of 9.4 milligrams per liter. So the idea about making sure that you have a key so you tell people what a stem and leaf plot actually means is super important. So if this data were made into a cumulative frequency plot, also known as an OGIVE, depending on how you pronounce it, or an OGIVE if you're being goofy, using the same interval width on the histogram, which interval on the graph would have the steepest slope? And would the graph be horizontal for any interval? And if so, where? So here's how we answer that question. Because the interval from 11 to 12 has the highest frequency, this segment on the cumul cumulative frequency plot would have the steepest slope. So that's your ping. Find your highest frequency on a cumulative frequency plot. That's where your steepest slope is going to be. And then because there are no observations between three and four, this interval on the cumulative frequency plot, plot would have a horizontal segment. So by examining this histogram, would you expect the mean of the data colder than eight degrees Celsius to be greater than, smaller than, or about the same as the median? So because the data is left skewed, we would expect the mean would be smaller than the median. And why do we expect that? Because as I tell my students, whatever hand you're grabbing the, the tail of the distribution with, the mean is going to be in that direction from the median. And so the median would be to the left or smaller than the mean. What is the approximate percentile of a, steam, a stream colder than eight degrees if it has a reading of nine milligrams per liter? And here's that hint back again, there's 429 data points. Well, I'm gonna find nine and I'm gonna count up how many values there are less than nine, because that's what a percentile is. We want to line everything up from smallest to biggest. You locate where you are. You turn around and look behind you. How many values, what percentage of the values are behind you? And that's your percentile. 43 observations are below nine milligrams. So therefore, the value at nine, at nine is a value. It would be at the 10th percentile. So let me emphasize again that a percentile is a location. So you the correct uh, um, val, uh, word to use is the word at. We are at a percentile, not in a percentile, in spite of what common language uh, is spoken in the non-statistical world. So again, we're at a percentile, not in a percentile. For streams warmer than eight degrees Celsius, the standard deviation is 1.64 milligrams per liter. We wanna interpret this value in context. So the dissolved oxygen concentration for streams warmer than eight degrees Celsius, there's my context, is typically 1.64 milligrams per liter from the mean. All right, would you describe these data be, to be continuous or discrete? And you wanna explain yourself. So I would say that these data are continuous because the values that have been collected can be any number in the interval. We're limited only by how precise our instrument can be, not by the values themselves. And so because they can be any value in that interval, they would represent continuous data. For example, it doesn't need to be a whole number or a number that's to the nearest tenth or hundredth. It could be the to the nearest hundred thousandth. But I, I just wouldn't be able to get that because I don't have a good enough measurement tool. All right, so we're back to the summary statistics and we're going to do some conversion. So I'm going to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit, but I don't want to take every single observation and do the conversion. I just want to take those summary statistics and convert them. And so I'm going to take and replace the value in Celsius with the numbers that are in my table. And so for the first group of them, all you do is take the minimum value and plug it in. 
and you take 1.8, multiply it by your old value, add 32, and everything's good to go. But there's one value in this table that I have to be super careful about, and that's the standard deviation. This conversion of just plug it in and multiply and then add doesn't work for standard deviation. And Jared has a really good explanation of why. And so Jared, I'm gonna have you explain it why. Yeah, so when I teach this, this with my students and we talk about um, multiplying times a number like 1.8, I was referencing the, the Marvel movie Ant-Man that multiplying by a constant expands or contracts everything about my data by that factor. Um, but when we talk about adding or subtracting a number from our data, we're literally sliding the data set up or down, in this case, up 32, but we're not changing the spread of the data. So I affectionately call this the cha-cha slide rule. When you learned um, translations in your geometry, integrated two, integrated one class, a translation is like the cha-cha slide, slide to the left, slide to the right. So now you've got a good song in your head for the rest of the night. Um, and when you slide to the left or the right, all the measures of spread do not change. And you could be thinking before uh, Deanna continues here, what are all the measures of spread and which numbers are not gonna change? Okay, so all I did here to get this new converted standard deviation is I just multiplied by 1.8. I just did the Ant-Man expansion. That's it. I didn't cha-cha on that one because uh, moving for, to, the, to the right doesn't change this the spacing between the variables, or sorry, between the measurements. All right, now I have to confess, I didn't do any conversion for these next two values. I found the IQR, the new one, by just taking the new Q3 and the new Q1 and subtracting, because honestly, you want to do the least stressful thing possible, and that was the least stressful thing possible. Likewise, for the range, I did exactly the same thing. I didn't try to convert. I took the new uh, maximum value and subtracted the new minimum value. Okay, I did it again, Jared. This is what I get for not checking, <laughs> not checking the new slides. I am so sorry. All right, so this is, what is the name of the procedure that would help answer this question? So the question is, what is the estimate for the difference in mean dissolved oxygen levels for streams colder than eight degrees Celsius versus that of streams warmer than eight degrees Celsius. So oftentimes students struggle with telling whether or not an inference procedure is a test of hypothesis or is an uh, interval estimate using you know, some kind of uh, command in their calculator. The key word here is to look for the word estimate. If you have the word estimate or estimate, then that means that you need an interval. And so, <laughs> If, you had, if I had done this correctly, I was hoping that you would say a two sample T interval to estimate the difference between the population mean for cold versus the population mean for warm. And again, I don't say it the way you all do in high school anymore because I need my students to be agnostic with respect to the way they write things. And so probably in AP world, you would say a two sample T interval and you would stop there. Is that correct, Jared? Uh, yeah, two two mean t interval. Um, yeah, yeah. I yeah. I think I think this year when I taught it, I said a two mean t interval for the difference of two means. I was really wordy this year. Mm -hmm. um, I think talking about the difference of the two means or the difference of the two proportions is a good thing to get on the top of your inference problem when you're um, naming the test. I think it's also good to remember that match pairs is mean difference, not difference of means, but mean difference. Um, so you should be careful with that. Okay, so now we're on super six question number three. So super six question number three is about uh, scatter plots. So a biologist gathered data on the length in millimeters and the mass in grams for 11 bullfrogs. They were probably not named Jeremiah. The data are shown in the plot and based on the scatter plot, describe the relationship between mass and length in context. So I believe that this scatter plot reveals a strong 
positive, roughly linear association between the mass and the length of the bullfrogs. Notice that's in context. And it's got a, what I call a wiggle word. And the wiggle word is a modifier to the word linear. It's not perfectly linear. So adding roughly linear or somewhat linear to this is super important because you can't make a declaration of exacthood unless it is exactly linear. So therefore I put that modifier in there to say, hey, it roughly goes like this, but not perfectly like this. I don't see any points that seriously deviate from the straight line pattern of the points that are in the plot. So I'm gonna mention that. So now I wanna identify and interpret the slope of the least squared regression line in the context of the problem. And you'll see that we've now added the predicted mass equation somewhere in the problem it's listed. The value of the slope of the least squared regression line is 6.086. It's important that you're able to pick that out carefully. It's the value that's multiplied by your input variable. This value indicates that the predicted mass of a bullfrog increases by 6.086 grams for each additional millimeter of length. Notice the word predicted. It's the predicted mass of a bullfrog, not the exact mass of the bullfrog. It's what we're predicting because that's the equation of the least squared regression line not the equation that picks out the values that we have in the scatter plot itself. So now we're given the R squared value and they're naming it as the coefficient of determination and I want to interpret it in context. So the coefficient of determination is 0.819 and here's what we're gonna do. That value indicates that 81.9% of the variation in the mass of the bullfrogs can be explained by the variation in bullfrog length as described by that line. And so I've got all the parts in there, the variation in here, the variation in here, and the fact that we're connecting it to a least squared regression line. So based on the plot, approximately what is the length and mass of this bullfrog with the largest absolute value residual? We have to remember what residuals are. So residuals are the difference between what we observe and what we predict. And this bullfrog right there has the greatest distance ignoring the direction of that distance. So the largest residual and absolute value belongs to the bullfrog with a length of 162 millimeters and a mass of 356 grams. And my presumption is that those values are somewhere in the table, but if they're not, then that's a pretty darn good guess of what the x, uh, the input and output variables actually are. Now I'm being asked to find out, does the least squared regression line over or underestimate the mass of the bullfrog that I just identified in the previous, uh, the previous um, part? and I'm supposed to explain my answer. So the least squared regression line overestimates the mass of the bullfrog with that length of 162 millimeters. How do I know that? Because the point for the bullfrog with a length of 162 millimeters is below the least squared regression line. So being below means that it's an overestimate, an overestimate. All right, we're supposed to find and interpret the correlation coefficient in context. And here's so. where the uh, new parts that I wrote start. The old, the original problem had four parts, A, B, C, and D. So, um, yeah, but now we're going to do all the rest of the, of the regression things. Um, these are, that, these are know. all on, these are all due to Jared and all his hard work. So working oh, with goodness. previous questions. No, no, no. seriously. <laughs> Totally, I mean, I can't, I can't say enough how much he does. His Mr. Math Man uh, website is, is super helpful, I think. So the coefficient of determination, I'm going to go back to that. It's R squared is equal to 0.819. Now, here's, here's an important point about R squared. I'm going to take the square root of R squared in order to get the correlation coefficient R. But remember, when you take a square root, there are two possible values. One of them is positive, the other one is negative. You have to pick the one that matches the direction of your scatter plot. My direction of my scatter plot is positive, 
So when I take my square root, I'm going to choose the positive value, 0 0.905, because of the direction of the graph. And that can be where students make a mistake. If this graph had a negative direction and they just willy-nilly take a square root and don't think about it, that would be absolutely incorrect because the value should have been negative if this direction were negative. So be careful about that. So I would say, because I have to interpret, I can't forget that, that there is a strong positive linear relationship between bullfrog length and weight. And I can say that not because I have the value of R, but because I have the value of R and I can see in the scatter plot that the relationship appears to be linear. So don't be fooled if you're not given a scatter plot, but you're just given a value of R, that doesn't tell you that it's linear. I already think that it's linear when I apply the concept of R to my scatter plot. So if interpreted in context, the y-intercept is what we call an extrapolation. So let's explain that. The y-intercept is actually negative 546 grams. Uh, I want to see a bullfrog that weighs this much or has this much mass. It makes no sense for a bullfrog to have, have negative weight. The collected data is only between 120 and 180 millimeters or 120, yeah, 120 and 180 millimeters. So making a prediction for zero millimeters is an extrapolation that produced a nonsensical result. So I have this bullfrog, it's 140 millimeters long and it weighs 320 grams. And I wanna find and interpret this bullfrog's residual. Well, the first thing I have to do is predict the mass. So I plug in 140 into the least squared regression line and I get 306.04 predicted mass for this bullfrog. And then to find the residual, I take the observed value and I subtract the predicted value and I get roughly 14 grams. So this bullfrog, interpreting again, weighs 14 grams more than predicted for its length. And how do I do How do I know it's more? Because the residual is a positive value. Now, this is this is a Jared question. I don't think anybody will ask you to do this on the AP exam. He's asking you to sketch a residual plot based solely on this picture. And then answer, does it look as we hoped it would? So here's what you would sketch out. And, and if this were an AP exam and a couple of your dots were a little bit off, it'd be okay, as long as they are somewhat proportional to each other. And so this is the residual plot with a line y equals zero, which means that if I had a residual of zero, I'd be exactly on the line. And here's what we would say, this graph looks random with no leftover pattern as we hoped. If this were indeed a linear uh, relationship, then what I would expect to see in my residual plot is no leftover pattern and a random scatter of dots. Okay, would a bullfrog that is much longer than the bullfrogs in this data set have influence on the slope of the regression equation and explain using the correct name of such a point? So what do I mean by a bullfrog that's much longer? Well, here's in that direction, much longer. Here's a bullfrog that's much longer. Here's a bullfrog that's much longer. Here's a bullfrog that's much longer. What are these points doing if they're included, if, if one at a time are included? Well, these are called high leverage points. They're in the, in the X direction, they're, ex, they're extreme. They're much farther from the rest of the points with respect to their X value. And they often exert a large influence on the regression, especially the slope. Therefore, any such bulldog would probably influence the slope. So how's the questions going there? Good? Uh, yeah, we're good. We did have okay. a question a while back and and I, um that we should clarify. Someone was asking about the technical definition of percentile, which then I grabbed the CED and looked it up to verify that the CED defines percentile as less than or equal to. Um, and I'm not sure if that corresponded with what you said or not, because I was typing away on something else while you were talking about that. It uh, did not because, and this is, you're gonna find this out once you get to college, 
the curriculum and exam document for AP statistics has a certain convention to it. Mm. And then when you come to university, your university professors might disagree with some of the conventions that are in AP world. And I am one of those people who disagrees with the definition of percentile. It's, you know, as long as I tell my students what the definition of percentile is and then share with them that somebody else might contradict me, it's an okay world to live in. None of us is, um, there's not 100% agreement on things in statistics, unlike in some other disciplines where, like calculus, for example, where there might be closer to 100% agreement on how you state things and how you do things. So it's it's something I have to, you know, I have to admit, that's a Deanna thing, not an AP world thing. Right. All right. And, and I don't think it would be a well-worded test question to ask students to parse the difference between um, your the 45th percentile is exactly at and below or just below strictly below i that would that would not be a well a well constructed question it it wouldn't yeah. help it wouldn't help the goal of the goal of ap stats questions is to help separate those of you who know stats really well from those of you who don't um right or and and exactly um Right. Also, so, uh, if this were, if the, let's imagine, let's 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 play the what if game. What if there is a question like this on the AP exam? Well, I'm on a rubric team, and I would argue favorably, I, I and, and convincingly that we can't punish students for instructors who use textbooks mm -hmm. that are that are different than what the curriculum and exam document yeah. says yeah. about AP World, and that it's too insignificant a difference in definition. I will, yeah. however, say that now that you've heard what you're supposed to say, that you should that you should get on well, board. Yeah. I would I would default to less than or equal to, but again, percentile is also just kind of a I don't know, a, a even below AP stats level yeah. thing. Yeah. Anyway, it's all right. On all right. regression. All right, so we have 11 bullfrogs. The mean length for the 11 bullfrogs is approximately 150 millimeters. What is the predicted mass for this for uh, this bullfrog at 150 millimeters? So we've got a bullfrog. It's exactly at the mean. It's exactly 150 milligrams. And what's special about this point? Well, fun fact, which is already stated here, 150 millimeters is the mean length of all the frogs in this data set. I'm going to pretend I have a frog at 150 millimeters. And I'm going to plug in 150 millimeters uh, into the uh, regression equation. I get a predicted mass of roughly 367 grams. Fun fact, 367 grams is the mean mass of all of the frogs in the data set. And there's where it, there's where that frog lives on the scatter plot. Holy cow! That bullfrog is exactly on the least squared regression line, and that's always true. The mean value of your inputs, coupled with the mean value of your outputs, is going to be a point on the scatter plot. It's one of those fun facts about least squared regression. Five of the bullfrogs are male and six of them are female. If the researcher randomly selects two of them, what is the probability that they are both female? <laughs> wow, I don't need the scatter plot anymore. Thank goodness. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say the probability that I pull a, a male is six out of nine, but then I took a frog out of the pile and now there's five females out of eight frogs left. I'm going to multiply those two together and I get 41.7%. And so here's the cool thing. I was wrong. I thought for sure I couldn't possibly talk about this in 90 minutes. And when I practiced this, it went way over 90 minutes. So we've got some time to answer questions between the two of us. And so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so that we can do that. So between Jared and I, do you all have some questions for us? Go ahead and put them in the Q&A and Jared will read them out. And we'll talk about the answers in the time that we have left. We just had a good question about residuals and leftover variation. Um, 
And I do like the idea of residuals as being the leftover, right? How do you calculate a residual? That's been a really frequent AP question over the years. I, I'll be, you know, I'd say there's a better than 50% chance you'll have to calculate a residual. That makes a nice little MCQ. Um, so you take the Y minus the Y hat, the, the actual minus the predicted. And what you're doing is you're saying, all right, how much variation is left over between the line and the points and between the line and the data. And what we're hoping is that the only thing left is randomness. In fact, in stat two and higher level stats, you really dive in and you want to make sure that the leftover variation isn't just random, but in fact that the residuals have an approximately normal distribution. Now, someone was talking about, you know, we only have 11, we, we have some data points here, 11 of them, and more of them are above the line but be them below. Well, we have 11 data points. What can you expect, right? Um, it's it's We have some random variation around the line. It doesn't look curved in any way. So what are we going to do? We're going to proceed with a linear model. Um, famous quote in the AP stats world or statistics world is all models are wrong, but some models are useful. Um, no data sets perfectly linear of interest, but it can be modeled with a linear model. Um, and the residual plot combined with, maybe you've hopefully finished your stat book by now, combined with a low p-value for the slope confirms that we can use a linear model and that we're good to go. So, so uh, I, I see a question that's all the way at the bottom. It says, typically, how many parts are in a non-investigative FRQ? And then compare that to how many parts in the investigative FRQ. So it's for those of you who understand the way it goes, the first five questions are the, I'm going to call them regular questions. And question number six is your investigative task. And, and the answer to that question for the first five is, it kind of depends on the context. Sometimes there's two parts. Sometimes there's it's it's an inference question. So the page is blank and there's no parts and you just have to answer it. Sometimes it's scaffolded in such a way that there's three or four parts. When you get to the investigative task, it just depends again on the the, the context of the question. So there might there might be as many as six parts or seven parts. So it uh, it's hard to predict for the investigative task. It's a little bit easier to predict for the first five questions. Did um did we have a we have two questions about the probability calculation. Was there a typo in that? Um, uh, it could have been. I I have to say that I took your I took your key and I just copied and pasted. I didn't <laughs> error check. So if it's if it's true, the, I see a, a student has asked. It shouldn't be six out of 11 times five out of 10. And I believe that you are absolutely correct, Weston, now that I look at that. So yeah, you're probably right about that. I I have a I have a propensity for typographical errors. Oh, um yeah. no, no, no. I but I'm I'm pretty doesn't matter how many times I look at something, I'm always gonna miss that little one little thing. And I passed out an exam to my students and I said, oh my gosh, there's a typo on question number four, please fix it. And then I just casually said, what would one of my tests be without a typo? And one of my students said, a better test. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch, yes. You know, teaching keeps us humble. Uh, so yeah. six out of 11 times five out of 10, which is a half last I checked. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see, times... So 27.27%. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. So someone just asked, is it possible to find the correlation of a scatter plot if you're given the regression line? And I, I understanding that maybe you don't memorize the formula for regression, it, you, you can't find the correlation without the data. You can, you can try to guess, but you might be well off the mark. So the calculation of R is you can look at you can look back at your uh, your textbook to find it. It's a it's it's not a simple thing to do. It's not it's not terribly tedious. Oh, well, it is terribly tedious, but it's not terribly complex in in its understanding. But you can't find R without the actual data. All right. Um, we have a question about confounding and lurking variables. Um, and this this is boy. 
you know, Deanna was talking about AP stats definitions versus the rest of the world. So AP stats defines confounding very, very narrowly and specifically that a confounding variable is a variable that is both linked to your explanatory variable and your response variable. So, um, you know, a simple example would be going back to a super old AP question, people who eat apples have fewer cavities. So is it the apple eating that causes the decrease in cavities? Well, maybe apples are good for you. They actually clean your teeth when you eat them because they're tough and fibrous. Um, however, we would expect that people who eat a lot of apples are also people who care about their health in all kinds of ways that have better brushing habits, better eating habits, eat fewer Twinkies and more fruits and vegetables, et cetera. So if we just take one of those variables, um, people who eat, eat apples have a better diet in general, then the better diet in general would be confounding because it is both linked to apple eating and it is linked to having fewer cavities. So that's a confounding variable. Um, the term lurking variable is not in the AP curriculum officially. Um, and we would, but it's an important idea. The idea is this, when we do an observational study, there are often lots of variables that are intertwined and that are affecting the response variable. So we look at things like health outcomes and education outcomes and uh, you know how much money people make. And there's all of these variables connected to our life outcomes, right? There's money, there's opportunity, there's gender, there's race, there's all of these intertwined variables. And so when we look at any one of them, it's usually not satisfactory it doesn't completely explain what's going on. And there's other lurking, extraneous, extra variables that are affecting the response variable. And that's part of what makes statistics hard to do. It's part of why you can major in sociology and psychology and all, all of these things, right? Um, and yeah, so- Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you all that I really appreciate the fact that Jared used the word extraneous because I think extraneous is- uh, a more um, appropriate way to talk because it lurking variables aren't standing around trying to like poke something. I mean, that idea of lurking just seems so, it's so goofy to me. Yeah. Extraneous just sort of is a nice umbrella term for what he's describing. It's a variable that may also come to play, but I, I am not considered, I'm not looking at it. I'm not studying it. And so confounding has that narrow definition, whereas lurking I, I just, I don't know what to say about it. Extraneous yeah. makes better yeah. sense to me. Well, and the the word lurking variable has been around AP stats for a long time. It was in one of, it was in the OG very first AP stats book that was ever published. And so it kind of lurked around for a while and then kind of famously in one of the rubrics, students were penalized if they used it. That's all a very long time ago. Um, I would say that as I've, you know, explained at length, talking about a confounding variable has been very specifically required to be connected to both X and Y, the explanatory and the response variable. So um, I'm sure as you're practicing for the AP test, you're going to run into that. Um, you should also just have a broad understanding that observational studies can can point us to valuable connections Um but that it's the extraneous, the lurking variables that make it so that we can't draw a causal conclusion, right? And so we run and run an experiment so that we control all these extraneous variables and we can we can definitively say that when I manipulate X, it affects Y. Um, and that's um, something that I'm sure you guys have memorized by now. So yeah, um, someone just asked a very uh, interesting question about, how, how, is there a place where you have like a summary of all of the ways that you can, mm. that you can understand what to do? And I, it, I don't, I don't know that such a thing exists, but I bet you could use your Google fingers and you could see if someone has posted a PDF on some website somewhere, that's a, like an inference summary sheet 
and you could say, does this seem to speak to me? Or you could create it on, on your own behalf so that you could say, okay, I always start with my college students and ask them, what kind of data do you have? Are you counting successes or are you measuring something? And that divides up the, the I actually have blackboards. You can see them behind me because my uh, department is not going to replace mine anyway. Um, so I divide up the, t and then I say, okay, so how, how are you asking the question and how are you gathering the data? Do you have more than one group? Do you have two? Do you have three groups? Do you have five groups? And then that's going to define what you do next. And so it, that's how I get my students to sort of answer this question on their own behalf. And then, then I say to them, okay, what are the key words that tell you, are you going to do a hypothesis procedure or are you going to do a, an a interval estimate? And, I, and it's pretty clear in the wording that if somebody says, do these data provide convincing evidence, bam, you have a hypothesis test. And if this says, can estimate something, an estimate is through an interval. And that's why in my class, we don't just call them intervals, we call them interval estimates of a parameter. I mean, I, I tell my students over and over again, statistics is about words, words, words and the, the more clearly you understand uh, the more clearly you define something the more likely it is that you're going to understand so i don't know of anything that exists so okay. that, did you google okay. finger it oh no there's a lot out there my friend so i appreciate your answer let me add to it um stats medic has a complete inference um organizer um I put a link to my website. If you go to my Dropbox, um, you can find one there. And you know where's a lovely place to get all your inference procedures organized is in um, um, is in the back of your book. The very back of your book oh, yeah. has an, an organizer. This is true for the Flamingo book and for Stats Modeling the World. They have a one prop, two prop, one mean, two mean, match pairs. Um, all the chi squared. Um, so um, there's an. Um, if you want flashcards, and I am, um, I think on Quizlet. Oh geez. Um, I think if you just go to, well, I could give you a link to my class. I'm gonna pull up a class here. I just got all my Quizlets organized. Um, just the other day. Oh, here we go. You could join my class. Um, I'll put the link in the chat as well. Um, and in my Quizlet class, I have Quizlets for all nine units. Um, yeah. The other document that I would look around for um, people that I would highly recommend is there's a number of different teachers and and this is something where I'm <laughs> I haven't made my own version yet that I totally love but if you google your way to phrases that pay um Mr. Starnes um the stats medic guy they've made these documents called phrases that pay um and they have like a whole list of regression sentences you should have memorized and then the p-value sentence you should have memorized and the conclusion for a hypothesis test you should have memorized, the confidence interval, the confidence level. Um, you can find these documents. Um, on that one, I'm gonna have to leave you to your own own um, Googling. Um, <laughs> one of my goals literally for the next week is to write a a, a one that is in my, my version of it. Um, but yeah, there's a bunch of resources. Um, the other thing that you would do, you've done a million inference problems with your teachers, with your teacher. I would encourage you to organize your own inference stuff. Go through your notes, find a one prop Z test, find a one prop Z interval, find a one mean T test, find a one mean T interval, find like one of every inference procedure get them organized. Um, maybe your teacher has a master set posted for you. Um, if you make that graphic organizer yourself, if you organize all those thoughts for yourself, you're going to remember it way more than if you just grab a PDF that you find online. But um, I know that's a hard sell. So 
I, I make my students make a graphic organizer. So. Um, As do I. Yep, there we go. Learning, learning theory. I'm at a university where there's many, many theories abound. But learning theory says that when you create your own organizational set, that it actually sticks with you more than if I provided on your behalf. Because what it is, is you're, you're taking all the puzzle pieces and you're creating your own uh, your own thoughts about how things fit together. And you could certainly, you know, make that organizer and then show it to your instructor and say, what am I missing? But yeah. I think it's- Or it's or just compare it to the one in the back of your book. Yeah. And, and Deanna's mentioned, and I'll double down, you need to really think about categorical versus quantitative. The first question we got tonight was about why I get an error message in my calculator when I put a decimal into goodness of fit. You shouldn't have any decimals when you have goodness of fit. That means you have quantitative data, not categorical data. And so you really need to start with what kind of data do I have? Is it categorical or quantitative? And that then that leads you down the road to props or chi-squared or means or regression. And you kind of have this branching flow chart. I had a brilliant student one year who missed like a ton of school for a college tour. And he came back and he was so confused. And I just made him make a big flow chart on my whiteboard. And it took him like 45 minutes. And then he stood back and said, oh, OK, I'm, I'm good now, you know. Um, he was super bright. He got a five. Um, your mileage may vary, um, but you know it's it's a great exercise for sure. So, all right. Any we, other questions? Yeah. Last call. All right. Well, so if we you if you come to the next set, um, if you come to the next section session, I promise to have fewer typos. <laughs> You're all good. Your PowerPoints were beautiful. Uh, we will do questions four, five, and six. So that'll be a lot of probability next time. Um, we'll do all the binomial and the geometric and the expected value. Um, we'll cover the experiment vocabulary. We covered the survey vocabulary, but not the experiment vocabulary. Um, I'm trying to think. We'll talk about just basic normal problems. Um, and yeah. So um, a little bit more inference. So we hope to see you in a week. All right. Goodbye to all of you. We have a few more questions. We have thank yous. So you are certainly welcome. And I think we can close.